Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And we're the folks behind abarabove.com, the ultimate resource for craft bartenders, bar operators, and pretty much everybody else who likes to drink. Yeah, this guy. <laughs> um, I'm a bar consultant with over 15 years of hospitality experience. And I run a bar above, which means I publish articles, I manage our social media, I hang out with all of you cool people on Instagram. Yep. Um, and in our Facebook group, which you can find at abarabove.com slash group. I gotta say, I love the Facebook group. I There's know. There's so many great conversations going on we in there. We have about more than 300 people in it already, and by the time this comes out, it'll probably be significantly more than that. Hopeful. So. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Come join us. Come join us. Now, there's some great conversations going on in there for sure. This is episode number 138, and this week we're talking all about small changes that you can make to your bar equipment, which will make a big difference to your speed, your sanity, and your overall happiness behind the bar. Yeah, so after long enough behind the bar, um, you find out kind of what works for you. So here are some of the tips that I came up with over my time uh behind the bar so <laughs> your excited. time behind bars right exactly <laughs> <laughs> but definitely excited to talk about little uh, equipment hacks and things to look out for when you're purchasing equipment definitely so the first piece of equipment we're going to be talking about is the humble but well-deserved bar spoon um, we use these all the time um, besides cocktail shakers i think this is one of the most iconic pieces of equipment behind the bar and very much associated with professional tools for bartenders. Um, and a good spoon is going to save you a lot um, mm -hmm. as far as comfort goes. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So first of all, here's something that I actually didn't know when we were talking about this episode. Um, Chris told me that back in the day, well, nowadays you can buy all kinds of bar spoons. There's tons of options out there. And right. That's wonderful. Back mm -hmm. in the day, there wasn't. It was pretty much this, no, this one. that one. And but imagine there was a little that, red cap on Right, there. exactly. I'm sure everybody who's watching this has seen the red cap bar spoon. Yeah, you maybe even I'm working with it right now, you too. You can buy like five of them for $1 or Right, it's exactly. It's crazy cheap. But the thing that I thought was really interesting is Chris says, what you would do is you would buy these. Mm -hmm. You would take the cap off right away because, duh. It's a signal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you would bend the spoon bowl. Yeah, so... Um, so, like, would you go this way or this? It really depends. So, for me, um, one of the things I would always do is just kind of bend it in this way. Oh, okay. Um, so, bowl, I would bend towards the bowl, if that makes sense for people that aren't watching on YouTube. Um, but what this did was, um, when you start to stir the cocktail, it actually created like this point. Um, it kind of oh. rotated around the cocktail um, glass a little bit better. This is when I was using pint glasses, but it still works for uh, mixing glasses as well. But I think this is kind of one of those tricks that a lot of people don't use anymore because there are so many better bar spoons out there now. That's true. Um, That's very true. So this is one thing that I recommend everybody do when you first get a brand new bar spoon is check the angle. Um, mm -hmm. Because depending on the length, depending on the height, all these things, the geometry of the, the bowl will actually change. And it could be a little bit more comfortable when you're stirring cocktails if you put maybe like a 5 or 10 degree angle, uh, yeah. more of an angle into it. And if you don't go too crazy, I would be really surprised if it would break. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously you didn't have that problem. No, I, and they're pretty sturdy. I mean, um, they're not going to fall apart on you, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but if they do... But it does make a huge yeah. difference as far as your comfort level goes. Definitely. Another thing to think about, which again, I mean, this isn't super recent, but... Um, one of the things I'm noticing is back in the day, again, you used to be only 12 inches. You could basically find all your bar spoons. They all look like this. Yep. Or yep. they all look like this. Yep. You have props. We don't usually do props. Yep. They're 12 inches long. They look exactly like this. And that's pretty much it. That was your choice. Um, nowadays, you have a lot more options. Mm -hmm. Namely, you have long options. Yeah. Which I think look a bit ridiculous. But if you're into stirring cocktails twice, two at a time, a skill I do not... <laughs> have or me <laughs> so i'm not going to demonstrate um that extra length makes a big difference um and so nowadays even on things like amazon you can find 15 inch 18 inch or even longer bar spoons um so if you're into that sort of thing or if you're interested in learning to stir two cocktails at once you think it would speed up your service behind the bar take a look at a longer bar spoon the options are out there now you don't have to go to some obscure shop in a big city you, you can you can just grab them on amazon yeah um, the and one I... thing to keep in mind mm -hmm. 
this does not fit in your bar roll. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and bet money on that. Um, you get a longer bar spoon, it's probably not gonna fit in your bag, so um, you might be that guy on the subway, just sort of like Big old bar spoon hanging out. With your and, bar spoon. Um, I never really got into the longer bar spoons. I thought they were a little bit too cumbersome. I mean, you know, you're in a tight space behind a bar, mm -hmm. and you got this long piece of metal like flying all over the place. Um, so I never tried it personally, but yeah. after the re recommendation, we actually asked this question in, the, in our Facebook group, um, after their recommendation and their reasoning why the bar spoon was so much better at a longer um, length, I tried it and I absolutely agree. Huh. Like, stirring cocktails is just much more of a pleasant experience the, with yeah. the longer handle. and It adds weight. That's the does. other thing that people mentioned is that it definitely adds weight mm -hmm. to the spoon overall, which is not surprising, um, and that can make the stirring a little bit easier as right. well. Right, and the geometry of the uh, spoon actually changes a little bit. The focal, like the balance point shifts backwards, so it's a lot easier to hold it higher and get a little bit more of an um, angle through the glass. And there's lots of room here to stick your pinky out. It's, it's super yeah, important, it's, yeah. you know, because you got to like, you know, wax your mustache <laughs> while you're doing it. I, li I like to wax my mustache. Um, um, uh, good for your mixologist. <laughs> <laughs> aside, uh, joking aside, give it a try. If you haven't tried it, it might be worth it. They're not expensive. Um, again, it, use what you like, but if it's a, an option you haven't considered, it might be worth a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Give it a shot. Um, the other thing that I never really understood, um, well, I do understand the reasoning behind the, the twist in a handle, um, but I had a bar spoon a long time ago that was smooth. The shaft was mm -hmm. really smooth and it was so much more pleasant to use because mm -hmm. you don't have that constant vibration and rubbing going on in your hands while you're spinning the cocktail. Um, so I actually had a smooth uh, shaft spoon and it was really, really nice. And back then it was really hard to find. It was impossible to find. I, yeah. I, I think I spent like $35 on this one spoon. And we're still um, married. I know, right? Yeah. It's crazy. crazy. Um, but by far it was my favorite <laughs> spoon. Um, I bought one for the entire bar team. Everybody hated it, but you know, but me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a great point though. And that is like, use what you like. Right. Um, but what you like may not be the sort of industry standard. So it, it's worth getting creative. We actually, when we released our own bar spoons, um, we created two versions yeah. because we're selfish like that and we want a smooth one. Wanted both, actually. Um, and so we created a spiral one and a smooth one. Right. And um, the nice thing that comes with the smooth one is, is just the nature of it, the, the same thickness of, of shaft gives you a lot more weight. So it's a much heavier bar spoon. Um, but again, it's up to your preference. You know, if you like the spiral, I've heard a lot of bartenders say the spiral helps them stir. Mm. And then I've heard Chris say that it hinders. So it's just a matter of your technique, what your hand feels like, what works in your hand. And if you haven't tried the other one, whether it be spiral or smooth, um, it might be worth a go. Right, again. absolutely. So the next piece of equipment is definitely one of my favorites. Um, and that is the Hawthorne strainer. And uh, a really good Hawthorne strainer um, should definitely have a, a, quite a few attributes. Um, first of all, it has to be super comfortable in your hand because you're going to be using this Constantly. all day long. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it has to be super durable and um, ideally it's got to have a super high um, coil count for a few right. different reasons. Um, so yeah, so first of all, comfort. Um, again, and you think you're going to hear this a lot in this episode, use what works for you. Right. I mean, this, this is actually our Hawthorne strainer. Um, this fits in my hand quite nicely. It may not fit in your hand quite nicely. You know, you may have really big hands. I don't know. Um, but when, when you buy a, a strainer, go ahead and try it out. Um, right. I think the thing, the two things that I would look for with comfort is make sure it has one of these guys. I mean, it feels a little bit obvious, yep. but I can't It's a finger it. grip for anybody that's not on, uh, listening on video. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, no, just, um, yeah. so somewhere where you can put downward pressure with your finger. Um, instead of a smooth flat top um, exactly. because then you're using a lot of extra strain and muscles um, that's going to add up over time. So, exactly. Um, so if you don't have that, you have nothing to hold on to. I can't believe they even sell strainers that don't have it, but they do. Right. So it's something to look out for. The other thing to look for is if you notice, um, if you're if you're watching the video, you can see as I hold this, um, you know, it, it is going to be touching the side of your finger. So you're going to want to make sure that it's got at least a somewhat polished edge. Some of the cheaper Hawthorne strainers out there it seems like they just stamp them out of metal and throw them right. Um, throw them out on the store shelves, and they're quite sharp actually. Yeah, they can be. Um, so that's something 
something to look for as well. Um, hopefully something you can avoid as far as the comfort factor. But again, try it out if you can. Just like try it in your hand, like feel it, touch it, um, and make sure that that's something that works for you and for your hand. Right, and the other thing to consider is just general size. Uh, Hawthorne yeah. strainers, just like any other piece of equipment, come in all shapes and sizes. Um, some of them I've seen are absolutely huge. Uh, with a long bar that comes off of it and mm -hmm. you know i'm sure they're great in certain scenarios but make sure the size is kind of works for you i remember one of my favorite um strainers um a long time ago was the old oxo strainers they're mm -hmm. super tight you know super compact they have almost no handle whatsoever right and i mean talk about speed you can throw that thing around and it weighs it's got some heft to it so you know it's not a durable product um, but it's not crazy heavy or crazy light. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of a nice strainer, a well-balanced mm -hmm. strainer. Yeah, again, so just find what works for you mm -hmm. um, in terms of comfort. That's probably the biggest thing. For durability, I think this one's kind of easy. I just have one one tip, which is don't, yeah. don't buy a strainer that has welds. Um, if you can avoid it. Yeah. Um, now, easier said than done, I know. But, um, for example, in this strainer, um, if you look at the little arms... <laughs> There you get some sound effects. Um, I don't know if you can see on the video, but uh, the metal is actually just bent. Right. It's not, there's nothing welded. And the reason is because if it's welded, it will break. It's and just I, a matter of time. I can't even tell you how many strainers I've broken that are welded. Um, you know, I, I did this whole uh, research in it for years, and I'm not kidding, probably about five years of experimenting with different strainers and um, trying them behind the bar. And I cannot tell you how many I've broken. Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding. Like, I would get one one week and it would broken the next week. Well, I mean, it's got a tough job. You right. Know, you've got temperature changes. You've got, I mean, and all endless... the banging that, I mean, I, yeah. when you're in a speed of service, you know, you're just throwing that um, strainer right on top. And typically when you see a weld, a welded uh, strainer, there's only like a small amount of tack welding on there. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the weld points are super, super brittle and weak. Right. Um, and next thing you know, you don't have a strainer or you're down one strainer during service. Um, so it's a pretty big arm, consideration. Which is kind of important. Yeah, no, and that, that's very <laughs> common. Um, so make sure yeah. it's all one stamped piece um, yeah. and it will save you a lot you know, down the road. Absolutely. I, I could not agree more with that. I think the last thing we talked about is coil count. Um, this strainer actually has a pretty tight coil, as you've probably noticed um, if you're looking at the video. There's lots of coils. By coil count, we mean like the number, mm -hmm. the number of coils. Um, but Chris told me an interesting trick that you used behind the bar every once in a while. Yeah. Um, so if you have one that isn't super heavy duty like this one, doesn't have a, a high uh, coil count, what you can do is if you have a strainer that was broken, uh, maybe in the past, um, you could weave them together. So you can increase the coil count that you have and it becomes a super kind of stiff um, uh, coil. You can actually see Julia's kind of weaving two of them together and it dramatically increases mm -hmm. your straining uh, ability. Um, this is for a lot of the older strainers. Like I mentioned the Oxo strainer, one of the biggest things that I hated about that strainer was the, the coil count was so low. It was. It basically only got the big chunks of ice, it's everything not, else flowed through it's it. It's not really straining very much. You absolutely need a fine strainer in that situation. Right, exactly. You do something like this, now this is actually um, too much, it won't Yeah, it won't it's pretty exaggerated. You won't need it if you have the strainer. But um, if you had if you had a spring that was looser and you had two of them, you could see how it would double your coil count and right. put you in a pretty good place, actually. Yeah, and um, they have different uh, diameters, so you can have a thin, uh, smaller coil inside of a bigger coil, which also helps as mm -hmm. well. Um, but the thing that, that this really does help with is um, filtering out shards of ice or fruit pulp. Um, the higher the threat, the coil count, the less likely um, you will actually need a fine strainer. Mm -hmm. um, this one you can you can't even see through the back of it. It's so packed um, that it almost acts like a fine strainer. We've actually heard a couple people say, yeah. "I don't even bring my fine strainer anymore because the, the coil count is so high; it gets everything." Yeah. So um, I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> bring one just in case. Um, fine strainer is a good thing. Right, but uh, you know, it's it's kind of um, it's one of those finer points of a Hawthorne strainer to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So the next one, uh, next tool we're going to talk about is this beauty right here, the julep strainer. Um, do you need a julep strainer? Mm, yes and no. Um, if you do a lot of stirred cocktails, I highly, highly, highly recommend you get a julep strainer. Um, it's also like five dollars. They're like, super cheap. They're so cheap. Yeah. Um, but and they just look cool. They're pretty baller. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, they are. Um, and you know what? Here's a here's a little tip for you. When you're getting through an olive jar, this is awesome. That's true. Grabbing a bunch of olives with your julep strainer and not having to put your hand in that bucket 
is amazing or maraschino cherries mm -hmm. um, because obviously it sieves through the liquid. Um, so Funny yeah. Funny story, not I won't go too far down this rabbit hole, but um, a couple months ago I looked in, I was in my mom's kitchen and she had one of these and I was actually quite annoyed um, because we actually sell these and she hadn't bought it from us. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, why, why on earth? First of all, why do you own a julep strainer? Let's be honest, mom does not make cocktails. She right. makes Chris make cocktails. <laughs> um, and it turns out she was looking for a pasta something. strainer or something it was, like that. It was, for, it was for like olives and things like that. And right. she had bought it on Amazon because she was like, well, that looks like a great little strainer for, stir for straining out olives and peppers and things that come in brine. So, um, That's funny. so there you go. Yeah. I, I thought that was hilarious. But actually. it really is the perfect tool for that. It um, is, absolutely. So, uh, but the other thing that julep strainers do, imagine in your busy bar, you're working through a bunch of drinks. You have a sour, you have a stir drink, all in the same order, beer, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, and you strain your, your uh, shaking cocktail, use your Hawthorne strainer. You're only using a Hawthorne strainer, so you quickly rinse it off. Um, and then you throw that Hawthorne strainer on a mixing glass or a pint glass that you have your stirred cocktail. You strain that out, and all of a sudden you have egg white pulp in there or mm -hmm. juice pulp in there. Um, it has ruined so many stirred cocktails for me in the past yeah. until I got a jewel strainer. You can really like, see Oh, that. I get it. Yeah. So... Yes and no. You don't need one, but it, man, worth, it does save it. It's worth the trivial investment. Right. And you have a nice brine strainer. <laughs> brine, brine strainer. Olive, like yeah. That. Olive and cherries and all that other stuff. Yeah, definitely. So the third kind of strainer that I think is worth talk, talking about mm -hmm. is the fine strainer. Right. Um, this one, I think, is... We briefly touched upon it a moment ago when you're talking about double straining. Double straining is where you d basically, I don't know where we put our Hawthorne strainer, <laughs> but um, it's where you strain through your Hawthorne strainer and a fine strainer to catch mm -hmm. those extra fine little bits of who knows what. Ice and um, pulp. Exactly. And, yeah. the th I think the counterintuitive thing about a fine strainer is that you don't actually want the tightest mesh in the whole world. Um, well, I mean, if you're a home bartender, you can go to town. Right. If you're trying to keep up with service, it's going to make you crazy <laughs> <laughs> because you have to wait for your cocktail to make its way through this very, very fine sieve. And it will be the smoothest cocktail in the world, but everybody will have left by the time you're done. Right. So just something to think about. You don't want the tightest mesh uh, ever. You want kind of a medium mesh, something that's going to be tight enough to catch your juice pulp, your your bits of citrus, your bits of egg. egg yeah. um, but again, you don't want it to be so fine that you're going to be waiting all day to finish straining. The Goldilocks, if you will, <laughs> of fine strainers. Um, and the other thing to really consider is just the volume, mm -hmm. uh, the size of the bowl that you're, the strainer actually is. Um, with this one in here, this is kind of the standard one you see in a lot of cocktail bars. Yeah. Uh, it's been around f since, you know, for 10 years that I know of. Um, but it's super tiny. Um, you can hold one cocktail in there maybe. Um, so if you're doing a double pour, it, you're going to be standing there and you're going to be waiting for and this you have thing to, wait, to work. Because it, a whole cocktail won't fit in there. So right. you have to wait for it to strain, pour some more, wait, wait, tap, tap, tap. <laughs> right. So this this just eats up a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to save a ton of time, but maybe over the course of the week. Right. You probably will. Um, so There's something you, that has a bigger bowl yeah. is definitely advantageous. I mean, the thing here, the bigger bowl not only obviously holds more cocktails so you don't have to pour more than once, but it also just gives you a lot more surface area. Right. Which results in a faster strain. Right. It's geometry. Um, so that's something that I would definitely look for in a fine strainer. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing um, for me, my biggest pet peeve behind the bar with uh, fine strainers is this. These wire handles are the terrible. Um, I, I can't tell you how many of these I've broken um, because typically, can you have me a Hawthorne strainer or a um, Boston shaker? So typically, and I apologize for the tinny sound that you're going to hear, but it's going to be pretty common for a lot of you. Um, the way you speed up your pour is by banging on the side of this mm -hmm. and what usually happens is these fail um, yeah. and they fall apart and I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it happen again and it's it happened to me time. I mean it's the same kind of weld that you see on the back of those Hawthorne strainers and right. it's the same exact reason it's a tough life I will give you that mm -hmm. but um, it's such a tiny surface area there's not a lot of room to actually get a really solid weld there and frankly these things are cheap they're super cheap they're super cheap I mean I mean I don't know. I've seen them for definitely five dollars. Oh, like that, yeah. If not less. You can go to a Chinese market and get them for like two bucks. A dollar, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so there's not a lot of room in the budget for that extra weld either. Right. Um, and so uh, it's going to break. It's only right. a matter of time. 
And if you want to invest $2, then you're probably going to be perfectly fine with it breaking. Make sure you have a backup. Right. However, one thing I've seen some bartenders do mm-hmm. is when, if and when one of these breaks, because one, one will break. They won't both break at the same time. Right. One of these will sort of break off and it'll stick out like this. <laughs> um, what this person did, and I, I'll be darned if I can remember who it was, they broke it off completely. Just, just broke off the rest of the handle. And actually, he preferred it that way. He ended up just holding his fine strainer by the little hook on the opposite side of the former handle and using his fine strainer just like that right. without a handle at all, which I thought was really interesting. And he said that he preferred it that way. Um, and well, there's nothing to break at that point. So that works. <laughs> right. And if that's something that works for you, great. And you get a lot more life out of your fine strainers too. So yeah, just these little tiny things really will help up, help you when you're um, going through service with a fine strainer. Um, you know, and all these things, little tiny things add up when we're starting to take a look at this equipment. You know, a couple of seconds are in service here, a couple of seconds are in service here. Add that up by how many cocktail orders you get, and you can start to see where mm-hmm. small differences start to, to make a big difference. It makes a big difference, definitely. So the next thing, next piece of equipment we're going to be talking about is this beautiful little piece of um <laughs> Technology. Your friend, your enemy, your yeah. frenemy. Yeah, the poor spout. <laughs> um, you find it on just about every bottle that's um, in your well, um, and they are perfect for what they do. Um, but there's a couple things that you can do to kind of increase their performance a little bit. Um, first of all, as you know, I'm sure all of you, that after a while they start to develop memory in the little flaps that keep them sealed inside the bottle. Um, this one you can see is slanted up like this, mm-hmm. where they should be pretty flat. Um, so one thing you can do, and you know this not, may not work a lot of the time, but some of the time it will, is when they start to create that memory, um, take them off during your cleaning cycle and throw them in a hot um, bucket of water, and it should be enough to kind of keep these guys flat again. Um, you could probably only do that a handful of times, but you know, if you get a little bit more life out of them, that's perfect. Yeah, it makes a big difference if it's leaking. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, always have extra ones around because you're going to go through them no matter what. So yeah. after, when they reach that point where they're no longer effective, throw them away. Um, the other thing you can do, I don't know if it's on this one, but um, I know some of the other ones I've done in the past, um, they have this vent, this air vent. You can't see it here, but they all have that air vent you don't want to close because it'll slow down um, the stream. What you can do is put a cocktail straw all the way through it, and it will greatly increase the breathing ability of the pour, hmm. um, so you get more consistent volume going through that, that pour spout. Um, this is really, really um, important for store and pour bottles, too. Um, you know, when you go through brunch service and you have a big store and pour of Bloody Mary mix or orange juice for mimosas, uh, you turn that thing upside down and it just starts slowly slowly pouring out. Does that air spout get clogged? It gets covered up. Yeah. Um, so what you do is same thing, you grab a cocktail straw, you thread it through that little air hole, um, and that's usually enough um, to keep it breathing faster, um, and then the volume comes out a lot better, more consistent for you as well. That sounds really handy. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those things that you uh, you figure out after a couple brunches, I think. Yeah, right. And now for the humble wine key. I don't know about you, but I have a sneaky suspicion you're probably not using one of those like flip down corkscrews behind your bar. If you are, um, I commend you. (laughs) I think my mom uses the same one. Um, You probably have a wine key. It probably looks something like this. Um, And while they all look quite similar, they actually have several different traits that differentiate them from each other. And I think that you have found some are preferable. Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing, uh, if you're going to be opening wine, and um, usually I think it's more along the lines for restaurant bars, um, but for me, um, the biggest thing that I look for when I'm looking for a new wine key is this double joint. Um, Mm -hmm. It gives you so much more leverage um, to get that first pull through um, if you have this knuckle here versus if you only have the one piece. I don't have one uh, I think I probably threw them all away. And for good reason. <laughs> um, but this really is such a huge advantage when you're going through service. Um, that This is by far the biggest thing I look for. Um, That's a deal breaker. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it seems like it does come up, but it usually come up comes up with like freebies. 
Right. Um, you get a freebie from a brand, and often it'll be the single find, which is not that great. Right. Or if you're in a, um, you know, you're going into service and you don't, you forget you don't have a wine key, and you go to Albertsons or Safeway yeah. or, you know, any other uh, supermarket, and you just have to have one. That's a lot of the time where you find one. Um, and you will hate your life. It, it's going to be unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when I first started out, this was very common. I would use different adaptations with them uh, or variations um, but this is the one I found that really works for me um, there's a couple other really big pieces of mm -hmm. um, to consider about these wine keys as well um, well I know the one you told me about is that the Teflon worm yeah um, you know also known as the screw this guy right here you may notice I don't I'm not sure if you can see in the video but um, this this one for example is stainless steel Mm -hmm. And this one is black in color. Um, and typically what that means is it's got a Teflon coating, which makes it slide into the cork much, much easier. Yeah, and I mean, I've tried using these before, um, especially on like cheap wine bottles where you have not one piece of cork, but it's a, like a composite. They press them all together. And this thing just destroys your corks. The stainless um, steel ones, the, yeah. Yeah, and I think this one even more so because it's got a little bit more of a thick worm to it. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to push the cork out of the way the bigger it is, the thicker it is, the more pushing it has to do. Um, the Teflon, as Julia mentioned, just helps it slide through there with less friction so you don't tear apart a lot of the corks. Um, the other thing with the cork is if you can find one a little bit longer, mm -hmm. um, it's always beneficial um, you know, to have a little bit extra wiggle room to play with so you don't break off that last quarter of your cork and have to push it through, um, as I've had to do many, many, many times <laughs> during service. Um, but that's another vital piece of the humble, humble wine key. Um, Serration or non-serration on the blade is a perf personal preference. I always like serrated blades because it just chews through the foil mm -hmm. um, very quickly. Um, and I think the biggest thing for me, um, besides the knuckle, is having the wine opener on the exterior of the, um, I don't even know what to call this thing, the knuckle, the wine part where you put leverage on it. Um, the beer opener? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, um, I mean, you can see, if you're watching the video, you can see the difference between these two. Um, one, one of the wine keys I'm holding up has the, uh, the, the beer opener on the outside, so I could literally open a beer without, without opening the wine key at all. Um, the other one, you would actually have to open the knuckle, I right. don't know if that's what it's called, um, to be able to open a beer. So that's an entire additional step that right. you would have to do. Yeah, and um, so there's two different ways Two different uh, wine keys that I've seen. This one I call the parrot opener. Um, many it of you, looks a little bit it like looks a like a little bird beak right here, right? Um, and then I have this one, and it's all about your leverage and where you want to, what you prefer. Um, so just find one that works for you. Um, like I, like Julia mentioned, um, opening up this gate here, it just slows you down, um, and it's just one more thing that kind of can get annoying. But if you were able to pull this out in the middle of service pop open a couple of beers, yeah. get an order out. Um, it just, you know, little things like that. It acts almost like a bar blade at that point where you yeah. just like toss it out of your pocket, open your beer back in your pocket, no big deal. Right, and um, I would always keep two of these with me. Um, one in each pocket because if I'm trying to figure out where my wine key is, doesn't matter what pocket I look in, you're going to have one that's and true. you're going to have a backup when somebody steals one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. We won't go there. <laughs> so the next thing kind of goes without saying and that is a sharp knife. Um, I think it's pretty obvious um, a sharp knife is going to speed things up as related to or as compared to a dull knife. Right. But more important than that, a sharp knife is safer. Um, it, if you have a dull knife, you're going to have to be pressing really hard, mm -hmm. which creates, uh, well, it, it makes it more likely you're going to slip and cut yourself. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, it just it's going to make better garnish. I mean, That's you know, true. you're putting all that pressure on a piece of lime or a wheel or something like that. Yeah, it's squishy. just going to chew it up mm -hmm. and, you know, juice it almost. Um, so having a really sharp blade really is beneficial. And I know, I know one of the more common ones right now, they have those little tiny ones um, that a lot, a lot of chefs wear in their coats. Um, and that has become a staple be behind a lot of bars. It's, the blade itself is only probably about six inches at the most. That's more than long enough for our yeah. purposes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and they're just razor, razor sharp. Um, but having one is super, super critical. And if you work in a restaurant, 
Um, one of the other things you can mention to the chef is they probably get their knives sharpened. Somebody probably comes in, depending on the restaurant, and sharpens all the knives in the kitchen. So throwing your knife into the mix, make sure you have your name etched into the blade somewhere, um, you know, bar, bar knife, um, to make sure it gets sharpened um, because it makes such a difference when you're, when you're cutting through produce and doing your mise en place. Yeah, absolutely. And it would definitely be overlooked otherwise. Right. And for me, I always like serrated knife, um, you know, a really nice high quality serrated knife. Towards the end of my uh, bar career, I would actually bring my own in um, just because, you know, some of them can get super aggressive and have a lot of teeth in it. Um, so same thing, it starts to chew through um, produce and start to juice limes and stuff. So a really nice, thin, beautiful serrated knife uh, mm -hmm. really worked out for me. Um, in terms of other tools, the last one that I wanted to mention is the fruit peeler. Um, ah, I yes. think, I know you have very strong feelings about this. I do, um, <laughs> but it's... You know, once again, it is all about your personal preference and how you're going to use this. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, uh, they don't make this peeler anymore. I've, I've actually had to look it up online. Um, this is uh, by Analog. That one's ancient, yeah. This is when I first started my bar career, I bought this one. Um, and the beautiful thing about this one uh, that I love is it when you draw it through lime or lemons, um, it doesn't bring up pith. Um, yeah, it's, a it's very, very specific. It's a very shallow blade. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that is quite hard to come by. Right. Um, a lot of times, because these are, are, for the most part, you know, when you buy a vegetable peeler, it's for potatoes. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's for carrots. It's where you need a little bit of depth to, to get that skin off of whatever it is that you're peeling. But not so much behind the bar. I mean, especially with citrus, you don't want that white pith. And so if you can find one that has that really shallow blade, um, that'll be a good choice for this sort of application. Yeah, and unfortunately I can't link to one because like I said, they stopped making this we one particular one. Um, but if you find one on eBay, the brand is Analon, um, and it's just a vegetable peeler. Um, but the other thing to consider is when you're, when you're using this peeler, it's just a straight flat peeler um, where the blade just is an extension of the handle essentially. You're putting a lot of pressure on your wrist as you're drawing through the, the, through the lemon, orange, lime, whatever you're peeling. They have new ones now um, that I've seen that I've used a couple times that are really, really nice. And they're more of the kind of the Y shape where the blade mm -hmm. sits like this. Um, and you basically just kind of glide through it like that. So um, the, bl the blade is perpendicular to the handle. To the handle, mm -hmm. right, exactly. And I'm starting to see these a lot behind the bar. And they're really super good comfortable. Yeah. Um, and they're dirt cheap. I mean, you can probably go to a restaurant supply store and pick one up for like three bucks. Yeah. Um, and they're colorful, so they stand out behind your bar. Um, the one thing to consider, and I highly recommend them because they're so good, um, but the one thing to consider with those is it's going to take a little practice mm -hmm. because you're not used to the geometry of the tool. Um, so you can chew up your, th your palm a lot in the beginning. Oh, really? I've had a couple of friends that I've worked with um, actually kind of start bleeding during service because oh, you just catch yourself and it doesn't quite know the difference between skin and fruit. <laughs> so um, like I said, just kind of take it easy, get introduced to the tool, use it a couple times during slow service so that way you're very comfortable with it. Friday mm -hmm. night, you know, four deep and you're freaking out a little bit. Um, so Not the time to start. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's a great, great zester and I highly recommend it. So a couple more tips for more of the sort of professional restaurant equipment that you may have access to behind your bar, especially if you're working in a bar slash restaurant. Um, the first of which is glass racks. Um, these are, um, they are the racks that you wash your glassware in. Um, and I mean, I think everybody kind of knows what they look like, even if you're not a professional bartender. Um, but one of the things Chris was telling me is that the first thing they would do when they would get these glass racks is go ahead and, uh, well, I should describe them first. You, you have your glass rack and it's, you know, square, yep. you know, Varying six heights. inches deep or right. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it will have prongs sticking up. They're actually like slots like a, a wine, a case of wine. Oh, okay. So little tiny compartments inside of them. Um, and it's great when you're only washing glassware. But when you're doing like bar tools and putting your mats in the washer and stuff like that, it could be kind of a pain in the butt. It gets in the way. Right. And, um, you know, so there's different, definitely a couple styles. One that has no kind of separation to them. They're just flat pieces with mesh on the bottom um, to let the water through. Um, and those are great. But then if you put glass runner, they're going to fall, bounce around, get chipped, break. Um, so what we did is we took a taller glass rack, cut half of it out. So half of it was flat on one side, half of it was glass on the other. So, so you get the best of both worlds. You can wash some glassware and then you can throw 
a bunch of bar tools in the other side as well. Right, exactly. And some, like if you have the, the kind of the compartments inside of it, um, you can't really stack a bunch of rocks glasses in there because mm. you can only do one per compartment. On the other side, you can just pack it full mm -hmm. of jiggers and uh, you can get a lot more um, surface area or a lot more volume of uh, dishes in there versus um, you know something that has the separations. So yeah, that's what we did is we got kind of a shallower one, cut it in half, um, so it took out the separations on half of it, and uh, the other half we left with glass. How'd you do that? Just with the trusty serrated knife, man. <laughs> Just go to town. Do you remember what I they said may about actually sharpening your knives. <laughs> right. This is one reason why you need this to. Is why? Right, but they may actually have them. Um, if you can find them, great. I yeah, ask, ask your uh, dishwasher rep. Um, the person that comes in and cleans and services your dishwasher, they may be able to get you one. Um, but if not, have at it. Go to town. <laughs> Go to town. <laughs> the other thing is probably going to sound a little bit obvious, and I suspect most people have probably already thought of this and already do it, but Cambros are awesome. Yeah, no, they're great. Um, the, you can use them for so much stuff. I think, the, 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 uh, like I said, I'm sure if you work in a, in a bar or restaurant, you already do. Yeah. But, I mean, you, you, Chris was telling me that, that that's something that you use for juicing, it's something you use for everything. infusions, for I mean, prepping. It's crazy, like everything. So like Julie mentioned, infusions, um, making um, big batches of anything basically where you just need a lot of volume. <laughs> Cambros are your best friend uh, behind a bar um, for sure. Um, but the thing, what how I would use them is I would make a giant batch of simple syrup. I'm talking like six to 10 liters. Oh, wow. um, like a lot <laughs> and then I would divvy them into um, smaller volumes and make all my simple syrups in one run mm -hmm. so if I'm doing a um, lemon peel simple syrup or something a flavored simple syrup I just take it out of the batch and then go from there not all of them can work like that but for the majority of simple syrup you can just do that um, so that was super super um, important to have a big volume like that Definitely. Well, and I think the nice thing about Cambros is that they're non-reactive. So you can do things like infusions. You can you can put acids in them and not, you don't have to worry right. about any sort of leaching or anything like that. Yeah, and when your ice bucket breaks, I mean, that's what I use to fill my ice buckets. Yep. In my wells <laughs> and stuff like that. And the other thing um, that um, that we did, um, we have we had a bunch of prep guys doing our juice, which I'm super grateful for, pretty spoiled in that scenario. Um, so how they would set it up is they had a juice machine they had a fine strainer and then they had a camera underneath it. So all of the fine straining would get done before we ever got a hold of the bottles. Um, so this really helped us out during production where, you know, in the weeds and kind of going through service where we didn't have all that pulp kind of slowing us down and having to clog up our, our strainers and stuff like that. So um, having that extra piece of equipment in between. So if um, you fine strain in advance, mm -hmm. did, did you just skip... The, did you just not double strain during service? We would double strain because of ice. Um, so uh, we get ice fragments. Um, so we, Probably we much wanna... faster though without the fruit pulp in the fine It strainer. was a lot faster. Yeah. yeah. And like I said before, you know, if you're fine straining or you're straining with your authoring strainer um, and then you go to do a stirred cocktail, you know, that crossover can, can really gum things up. And this it was a lot less with that until we started doing julep strainers. Sure. Um, so yeah, it was just that one little extra um, step uh, really did save us a lot. And it didn't clog up our pore spots either, um, nice. which is super good. Nice. Yeah. So hopefully this episode has given you a little bit of inspiration for some tweaks and tricks that you can use behind your own bar with the equipment you have, or maybe some suggestions for equipment that you didn't know that you could try. Um, again, a lot of this stuff is very, very inexpensive, um, especially things like wine keys or bar spoons or all this sort of stuff. Um, it really, uh, if you if you don't know to try something new, uh, then uh, you might be missing out. So it might be worth just investing that five, ten dollars and giving it a go and uh, you might find something you really like. Yeah, and a lot of the things that we talked about is, you know, limited perspective. We, we don't hear a lot about this stuff. Um, our Facebook group actually talks about this kind of stuff quite a bit. But, quite a bit. Um, you know, if you have a, t a tip or a trick or a hack uh, for your bar equipment that you like to use behind the bar, we definitely love to hear yours as well. Um, the more we can talk about this kind of stuff, um, you know, the better bar equipment we're going to have. Absolutely. Um, so we'll definitely love to hear from you guys yeah, as you well. Yeah, you can put those in the comments in the show notes, which you can find at mixologytalk.com slash 138. Or, of course, um, we will post about this podcast in all of the usual social media places, so you can comment there as well. Um, if you happen to be 
if you happen to like the bar tools that we've mentioned are our own, then you can actually find them on our own webpage at abarabob.com slash tools. Um, that page has links to all of our own equipment. I think we've got a pretty decent little uh, little lineup nowadays. Almost um, a full catalog. Yeah, which is crazy. Super exciting. I know. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. Um, so if you, uh, if you like what you see, um, definitely check that out and we would we would be very grateful. One little last piece of advice or a hack for you. Uh, when you're moving out of an apartment um, and you put drywall anchors in your drywall and you need to get them out, that's the perfect tool. That's very true. The worm in your co or your uh, wine key is perfect for digging those things out. That's true. Yeah, uh, you'll have to patch up the drywall, but if you want to get it I've out. I've heard from my friend who grew up in a military family, toothpaste. Ah, toothpaste. Yeah, if it's just a, like a cheapo apartment and people aren't paying that close of attention, <laughs> you might be able to get away with toothpaste. Little tip of the day there for you. Don't hold me to that. Like, right. If you get if you get your deposit withheld because you took our advice, like so minty no fresh promises. in this apartment. It's so great. It smells so good. I can't place it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Again, the show notes are at mixologytalk.com slash 138, and the tools are at abarabove.com slash tools. And if you want to join us in our Facebook group, that is abarabove.com slash group, if I remember correctly. <laughs> I hope that's right. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Do it again. You didn't like it. I didn't like it. Oh. I mean, we could go for it. <laughs> so refreshing. Do it again! From the top! From the top! <laughs>